see the confidence and the hope that is shared by that individual's family when they discuss and talk about the testimony that should encourage us. You know, that so eternity is for real. And the forgiveness of sin in Jesus that makes us spotless in God's eyes and the atoning sacrifice for our sin, it should encourage us. So I look forward to uh, hearing at funerals what people have to say because it's just so cool to get to know all people's faith in a deeper way when you hear them talk about it at a funeral. So we look forward to that. So yeah, I went to Dr. Friday <clears throat> for a totally unrelated issue. And I come home and Friday night I start feeling bad. You know? <laughs> like, Diane's got the same thing. She was traveling. Now she's feeling bad. It's like weird, isn't it? Now I gotta go back to the doctor. You know? <laughs> Say, hey, I was here, I should have told you I was gonna be sick, you know. But so anyways, so I, I have my manly voice today for you guys, so that's why it sounds so romantic to you ladies. I train, you know. I'll just stop it, Charlie. Come on. Let's just, Let's just move on. <laughs> but here we are in, in James now, okay? We're, we're up to verse 14. We're going to finish a chapter today in, in James chapter 2. And it's talking about having a living faith. And when you have a living faith, there's going to be this evidence of it. And one specific area that where you have this evidence is that there's this loving response, right? This loving action that comes out in our lives because we have a living faith. You know, it's, it's really, it's real, and it becomes evidence that way. You know, as we uh, look at these verses, I think it's good to remind ourselves of the audience that James was writing to. These Christians in the, the church uh, came from a Jewish background. Right? And you think about the Jewish background, you know, you had the Levitical law, and so you're following all this stuff, and you get caught, people will get caught up into this, this works idea, because here comes Jesus, and they had this discovery, and they got this joy of salvation by what? Faith alone. Okay, Faith alone in Jesus Christ. So here they are. They know this, this, this relief from this freedom that is there from works to gain righteousness. It's, it's just not there. They, they understand this. And, but then at some point, many of them went to this extreme to think that works didn't matter at all. And so that's kind of the setting that you have, James, when he's writing to his to his audience there. And so he begins by challenging them to, challenging this claim that they have to faith. And it's okay, isn't it, as brothers and sisters, to challenge each other's faith? You know, really? You know Jesus? Really? What's, I mean, why do you know Jesus? You know, so he's, he's challenging them there. Here we come to verse 14, and he starts right out, and he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but they don't have any deeds. Can such a faith save them? Right? I mean, he just throws it right out there. Here's the point. And maybe it's a, a better to put it as a question to us today. Where is your claim to faith making a difference? Is that fair? You know, we ought to be able to respond to that. But where is your claim to faith making a difference? Where is it making a difference in you? And where is it making a difference in the world around you? You know, where is your claim to faith making that, dis that difference? Because, you know, a faith, a faith, guys, that is not exercised in one's life, okay? It's not worked out in one's life. You know, a faith like that, you'd have to say it's dead, right? That's what James is saying. It's useless. You know, if there's, there's it's not working, there's no working out of your faith, then really you have a useless faith. You know, the word for faith implies this idea, and it's in your notes, of trust or, or belief or conviction. And so James here wants his audience, and by the fact that the Word of God is living and active and powerful, right? You know, it's for us today, too, by that purpose. He wants us to understand that faith is more than just belief. And we'll see that today. It's more than just belief, but it's this, this deep trust in God. And that deep trust should impact us, shouldn't it? It should impact our actions. And so I say, how's that been going for you lately, right? How's this faith you claim to have been impacting your actions, how you live all your life? How's that been going for you? You know, the Greek word for works carry, carries the idea that it's a deed or it's an action. A couple quotes for you guys. 
uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, faith without works is not faith at all, but a simple lack of obedience to God. You know, so as Christians, we need to live out our faith through actions. Not just good intentions or works, but we live out our faith in actions. We, uh, we had the food pantry, the food truck here on Thursday, and I'm out on one of the corners. I forget what those corners are. And I see this, this couple walking up the street, because you know, the pantry was over here by the church. They worked the way down. They're coming up, and they're pushing a shopping cart. And I see them stop, and they wait, and they wait, and wait, you know, catching their breath. And then they work up a little bit further, and I see them stop again. And I thought, I'm thinking, man, these people are struggling. Whatever. That's okay. I don't care. No, it's not what I did. You know? <laughs> that would be really bad. You know, I should care about people. And so I, I left my post, then get in trouble, and uh, walked over to them. And I said, you guys are struggling, aren't you? Moving this thing. Oh, yeah. They had to go about, good grief, they had to go up. And they had to go over like four blocks, then up, and then up a two-track. I mean, and when I, anyways, I took them, I gave them a ride home, okay? So you just sit in the shade until I'm done, and I'll give you a ride home, okay? Now, I hope even someone who doesn't know Jesus would care about someone enough to help them, okay? But when we do know Jesus, then, yeah, we should care enough when we see someone struggling that if we can, we should help them. Not just push a shopping cart, which was really an old, broken shopping cart, okay? But we should care about those things. We should do those things. You know, Spurgeon says this, Faith and works are bound up in the same bundle. He that obeys God trusts God. And he that trusts God obeys, obeys God. And he that is without faith is, is without works. And he that is without works is without, is without faith. You know, it just... The evidence of our faith is our, you know, it's just like evidence, faith, evidence, you know, here it is, it's the same ball, you know, and it, it, it has to work together. And uh, why would he say that? Why would he say that, you know, faith and works are together, that some without works to back up their claim doesn't have a saving faith? Why would he say that? And I think that Lewis uh, gives a good quote on this to kind of answer that question. And he says, regarding the debate about faith and works, it's like saying which blade of the scissors is the most important. Okay? You know, which, they both work together, right? You know, which, which is it? You know, Jesus, I think, makes the point himself in Matthew 7, Matthew 5. He's, when he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, and neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead... They put it on a stand, and, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Well, then in the same way, your light should be shining, light, right? Let your light shine before men, men and others, so they may see your what? Your good deeds, the evidence, right? And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, I, I was a Boy Scout. Anyone else Boy Scout? I was a Boy Scout for one year. Yeah, Boy Scout, okay. And I joined this club when I was 17, and when you're 18, you can never be a Boy Scout again, you know? I grew up in Chicago, and, and in the summer, I, so I wasn't even a Boy Scout a year. Anyways, I was a Boy Scout. And uh, all these other guys were Eagle Scouts already, okay? Well, I got to thinking about that with the Eagle Scouts. A year I spent with those guys, and everything they knew, and everything they could do, and all the merit badges they had that I didn't have, you know, kind of thing. And um, let's say someone came to me today and said, hey, I was an Eagle Scout. You know, what am I going to think about this guy? You know, you, you're an Eagle Scout? Really? Well, there should be some proof, right? Not just the little thing. There, there should be some proof. And so I might say to him, well, you know, can you help me tie this knot? Because there's a lot of, there's a knot tying merit badge, if I'm not mistaken, you know. And you know all these different types of knots that they can do. And, could you do this fisherman's knot for me? There you go. I'm showing some wisdom about them. I don't know the names of other knots. <laughs> I remember that fisherman one. You know, it was a big long one. I think. You know, you know. Can you do this for me? And they go, oh, I, don't, I don't know. You know. Well, how about first aid? You know, I got the sore here. This cut. 
Can you help, you know? Oh, I don't know if I can help you. Well, dude, can you help me survive outdoors? You know, if I go through all of this with this person, and I'm saying, well, your position has knowledge, but it ought to be, be able to be lived out. If you can't back up your claim that you're an Eagle Scout with proof, with action, then I would say, man, I doubt you were really an Eagle Scout. Okay? And so that's what's going on here with us in our faith, you know? And I think it's even worse. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I think it's even worse uh, for, than someone claiming they're an Eagle Scout and they're not. I think it's even worse that when we say we have a faith in Jesus, but that our faith doesn't have concern, our faith doesn't have compassion for others, well, I... That's demeaning to the Boy Scout, to you know, the Eagle Scout stuff, but how much more demeaning is it uh, to our faith that we claim to follow if we can't evidence in our life our faith through how we care and how we love others? James says, can such a faith save them? Okay? Just, if you just have words, he's saying, can that faith save them? So let me ask you, what good is all the faith in the world if it doesn't move you to action, right? You say, I got faith, but I don't do anything. I got faith, it doesn't make a difference. You know, what good is to say you have faith? Well, even to believe something, but it doesn't make a difference in your life. What, what good is it? More difficult, uh, I think, is can a person with an inactive faith truly be saved? And James is bringing this question up. With an inactive faith, can they truly be saved? And I think that's the part of this first verse that's difficult to reconcile. When he says, can such a faith save someone? Okay? Can it do it? And I don't think he's going against other scriptures. I don't think he's going against the Apostle Paul. Uh, what did the Apostle Paul insist on in Ephesians 2, 8, 9? He said what? Uh, For by grace you're saved through faith, right? And not of what? Not of works, okay? Not of works, because, you know, someone might want to boast about that. So James merely clarifies for us that the kind of faith that saves, that's what he's trying to tell us, is we're saved through faith, not works, but saving faith will have works. Works that evidence and works that accompany it, okay? Now, you might look at uh, your life and say, I know I'm saved, and I can see where God has has used me in these areas, and that's that's important. And you need to be able to see those things in your life to give you the assurance that you that you know Jesus. The Apostle Paul also understood, though, the necessity of works in the in someone's life, because right after declaring those words in Ephesians two eight nine, he throws out verse ten. And what's he saying, verse ten? For we are God's handiwork, created in Jesus to do what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for those who love him. So Paul wrote also in Titus, he said this, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Yeah, faith and works. They, they just have to go together. They just have to go together. There are the evidence and the confidence that it gives you also. Clark says this, and he concludes someone's uh, confession about faith, because James said if someone claims to have faith, Clark says he didn't say he has faith. He says he says he has faith. Okay? He might have been referencing someone who truly doesn't even know the Lord. So faith and works are both necessary, though, I think, for a healthy Christian life. You know, In 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, right? In verse 13 it says, and now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. And I think that verse just tells us how important faith is, but it's not that it's the only thing that matters, because love, right, love is shown how through what? Our actions, right? That's how love is shown, through our actions. So in verses 15 to 16, he gives us an example of dead faith. Dead faith. When you leave here today, you should say, yeah, I know, I love, I know, I know, I know that I am saved. Or you should say, boy, I need to get saved. Okay. He gives us an example of a dead faith. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to them, hey, go in peace, 
keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, well, what good is it? Okay? What good did you do? You know, what good is it? He says, you see a brother, you see a sister in need, this is someone whom you share faith with. This is someone who's in your church body. This isn't just someone that you happen to meet on the street pushing a shopping cart, right? But someone whom you're in fellowship with. And if you see this person and they're in need and you try to warn them, warm them by just mere words and nothing else, he's saying, is your faith real, right? Is your faith making any impact, right, in, the, in your daily walk? Someone says, yeah, I, I love Jesus, you know, I follow him, but your life doesn't mirror, right? Your life doesn't mirror the life of Christ. Because you just ignore the needs of others. And that's where he's focusing here. You ignore the needs of others. And sure, you offer lip service. You know, James is saying, lip service isn't good enough. So just go in peace, be well fed and kept warm, you know. He says, where's evidence of your faith? You don't even care about your brothers and sisters. Where is it at? You know, this example, this, these, this example, they fully understood that there was a need and that they, they needed help. They fully understood that. And they, and they conveniently, though, though, left the caring of these people to someone else. You just, that's not what a Christian does. That's not how we show evidence of our faith through love for those who are around us, especially our brothers and sisters. I mean, you were talking about Let's be straight on this. The, the simplest good works towards a brother and sister. Every one of us have clothes, right? I'm glad you wore them today. Okay? <laughs> Every one of us, praise God, have food. To some degree, to some level, every one of us have food. I mean, it's, it's just the most, the most basic that is there. So it's the simplest of good works that can be done. And that's why James says, an unwillingness to care for people, in the most simplest Things of life, just food and clothing, okay, demonstrates that, man, you just don't show a living faith. You just, this is how much more easy could it be than to take half of your piece of bread and give it to them? How much easier could it be than to take that second shirt you have and give to them? You know what I mean? Come on, this is the most basic, easy things to do. And if we're not willing to do that for others, where is the evidence of our living faith? So he's demonstrating that someone does not have a living faith. And he's saying you can only be saved by a living faith. Right? You can only be saved that way. James 17 says this. In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Okay? That's what he's saying. You know, can you imagine um, staring at a dead fish? You ever done that? You know, only if you try to, if you're mean, you try to gut it or something. Then you, you know that's a dead fish, you know, and you really messed this thing up, okay? But imagine staring at some a dead fish, and this person next to you keeps saying to you, it's alive. It's alive. You know, really? You know, and so you stare a little bit longer, and you stare a little more more intently, and you're trying to look for just the slightest movement. You know, they, they said it's alive, and you're staring at this thing, but there is no movement, you know. You're, you're looking at a dead fish. So at some point you turn to this guy and say, man, that fish is dead. That fish is dead. And you say this because there's no logical reason to believe it's alive, right? It's out of water. It's just laying there. There is no movement. I'm going, that's a dead fish. Regardless of what my buddy thinks, that's a dead fish. Time for Charlie to try to get it. Can't do any more harm, right? That's a dead fish. And James is saying, the faith that you claim to possess, it's meaningless. It's useless to others. It's as good as dead. Because there's no life to your faith that you claim to have. He's saying if you, if you, uh, you claim to have that, it's dead. But you, you go, well, I want to defend myself on this, you know, so you fight, you fight back against James. And you say, how can you say my faith is dead? You know, how can you do that? How can you say my faith is dead? You know, so James just hits him a little harder where it hurts. And in verse 18, he says, but someone will say, I have faith. You have, someone will say, you have faith. Well, I have deeds. Okay? I have deeds. And 
you know, he says, I'm living out the reality of my faith in Jesus. I have deeds. I'm, I'm helping meet the needs of others around me. I have deeds. I'm sacrificing my time. I'm sacrificing my possessions. I have deeds. I'm sharing the love of Jesus with words and actions. Yeah, my faith has deeds. Okay? That's where my faith is. Now you, show me your faith without deeds. And I'll continue to show you my faith by my deeds. So don't tell me you follow Jesus, he anxious saying, when you don't live out and do what Jesus would do. That's fair? I hope you think it is. Okay? That's fair. But you continue to still defend yourself in that setting. You go, man, I know that I have faith in Jesus. Doesn't show, <laughs> but I know I have faith in Jesus. I said the sinner's prayer. Okay? You ever think about that, the sinner's prayer? A little story about that. There was this, he went to, this person went to the orchard, and, uh, and it must have been the springtime. And he went walking through the orchard, and he come across this tree, and he said, oh, what kind of tree are you? He says, oh, I'm an apple tree. Oh, that'd be awesome. I'm going to come back in the fall and get some apples from you. That'd be great. I'll be here. You know? And so in the fall, he comes back to the orchard, he walks out to that tree, and there's these yellow, these orange balls hanging from this tree. Okay? And he goes, I thought you said you were an apple tree. I am an apple tree. Yeah, but I got these orange balls hanging from your tree. They kind of look like oranges to me. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm an apple tree. Well, how can you say you're an apple tree when I say or Listen, don't argue with me. When I was just a little sapling, I prayed the apple sapling tree prayer on the apple tree. Okay? Now just, you got to be careful, right? You know, I prayed a sinner's prayer. I heard I prayed a sinner's prayer. I must be saved. He's just challenging them in that. Don't tell me that. You continue to defend yourself. And you know what? It might be true they prayed a sinner's prayer. Okay? I did. Actually, yesterday was my spiritual birthday. No one told me happy birthday today. <laughs> September 7th, 1972 at 7.36 p.m. You go, well, how could you know that? Because I happened to look up and there was a clock. Okay? And I've never forgotten it. Okay? September 7th, 1972. Happy birthday. The best birthday, isn't it? The best birthday of all. I'm just glad I remember it. That I, I have that. I know that was the moment when I came to faith in Jesus Christ. See, I prayed the sinner's prayer. I believe in God. But you see, someone may have heard the truth, but it doesn't mean that that truth has taken root in their heart and life, does it? Just because they've heard the truth. Has it taken root? In fact, Jesus, in Matthew 7, says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those, the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. That's who. The verse shows that actions Doing God's will are just as important as faith. You know? Just part of it there. Perhaps the Apostle Paul uh, in 2 Corinthians 13 is why he wrote this. Examine yourselves. Why? Why? To make sure you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. It didn't just head now, does it? Has it made it to your heart? Or has it lived out in your life? Examine yourself to make sure, to see whether you're in the faith. He says, test yourselves. Is there love? Is there love evidenced in action, right? Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, what? You fail the test. It becomes obvious to you that, no, it's just been a head knowledge. I need to examine myself. So here's a good thing to consider. If I were to say to you, show me your faith apart from your works. I mean, if I would say to you, show me your faith apart from your works. What would you show? What would you point to? Okay? What would you do that? Now, perhaps you might respond, before I trusted Jesus, I, uh, I looked for contentment in the things of the world. Well, that would be, that would be good but to, to be able to see that, to remember that. You know, I, okay. And before I put my faith in Jesus, I, I never thought about reading the Bible. Okay? Well, I could believe that too, and I'm glad you do now. Okay? You know, that, that would be something you could point to. And 
Before I knew Jesus, my thought life was out of control. You know, just totally out of control. Before I, I, I trusted Jesus, I didn't care how I treated others. You know, before I trusted Jesus, I was afraid of dying. Maybe there's a list that you could come on, but James is dealing here with where's the action in our life? You know, where is it lived out in how we serve the Lord in our life? That's what he's doing. And your changed heart should be impacting how you live your life. Again, how has that been playing out for you recently? Your changed heart should be impacting how you live your life. And in verse 19 he says, You believe that there is one God? Well, good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. And make no doubt about it, the demons' actions are unrighteous. Right? If they, they know there's a God. They believe there is a God. But the fruit of their existence is just rotten, isn't it? You know, the demons. It's just, just rotten fruit in their lives. That's why knowledge alone won't save anybody, will it? Your knowledge alone about who Jesus is won't save you. Knowledge without saving faith is worthless, James says. It's, it's dead. And he goes on in verses 20 and 24. It says, you foolish person." Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Well, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. You foolish person, he said. What does that mean? That's pretty strong words, isn't it? You know? You foolish person. And it just means an empty man. Okay? It comes on, you know, metaphor like from a from an empty an empty container. That your faith without fruit is just empty. You know, it's just like you're you're nothing. You know, there, there's no evidence. It's just, you're, you're empty. You need fruit. And Abraham was counted as righteous, it says. And here the point is made that Abraham, here Abraham, had this incredible faith, and it was active in his works. And we, we know the story of Abraham there with Isaac. And it was active in his works. And he had, his active faith was counted as such because he was willing to go to the extreme in obedience to God. You know, and this is, yeah, I know you love me, Abraham. I know you trust me, Abraham. I know you're following me, Abraham. And he proved his faith was real by his actions. God's not asking us to do something like that. He's saying, you know, there's someone who needs some food. There's someone who needs some clothes. And you have some food and you have some clothes. Why won't you share it with them? Just, we need to look for how God wants to use us, right? Look for the, and, it, and it doesn't mean it's going to actually be easy. It didn't necessarily wasn't easy to share the little bit of food they had. It wouldn't be easy to share that extra garment that they had. But the point of it is, we can and we should. And we will when we have a living and active faith. In verse 25 it says, In the same way was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. You see, Rahab, she clearly demonstrated her belief in the God of Israel. In that moment, she did that. She demonstrated that. And she acted on what she believed. She acted on her faith. And her actions had faith that demonstrated her righteousness. See, if you want to go dig a little deeper into this faith and the, the great people of faith, you go to Hebrews, Hebrews 11, and you got this list of the heroes of faith there. And what you'll notice with these heroes of the faith is that many of them we hold so high in regard, both had an incredible faith and righteous works. You'll see that if you read that. So you go to Hebrews 11 and just kind of dig through that a little bit. And you'll see that those kind of go together. And uh, in verse 26 he says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works, without faith without deeds, is dead. Dead. Okay? That's what he's saying. So the Spirit gives life, then the deeds prove that we have a saving faith. Is, is this good for you today? You know, if 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 you're just kind of like been walking through this life that you say is of faith in Christ, 
and there's nothing going on for Christ in this walk of faith for Christ, then you need to pay attention heavily to what's being discussed, and you need to get your action in gear, right? And get moving for Jesus in those moments. You know, again, just because someone serves doesn't mean they know Jesus, does it? Just because someone is real active and does a lot doesn't mean they're, they're doing it because they love Jesus. Maybe they're doing it for wrong motives. But if you love Jesus, you'll, you'll get moving, won't you? You'll make sacrifices. You'll do things for the Lord because you love Him. Faith and works are partners. Just like Lewis said earlier when he gave the example of trying to decide which blade and a pair of scissors is the most important. Okay, you got to have both blades for it to work. got to have it. The reality is you need both, okay? And if we're a follower of Jesus, we're going to be cutting some smooth stuff, right? It's going to be working. We're going to see that faith going. Your faith, your works will flow from your faith, and your faith will grow as a result of your works. You know, as we just kind of wrap this up, you've probably heard uh, the comment that, you know, faith is like a, a muscle, right? And the more you exercise your muscles, the stronger it becomes. I, and I know that, you know, all of us are, are bodybuilders and we know how that works. Or we know a bodybuilder. <laughs> but it's true, okay, that as we exercise that muscle of faith, it becomes stronger. But the thing of it is, not all of us are necessarily inclined to uh, or willing to thrust ourselves out there into situations that will stimulate faith to grow, okay? But we need to. We need to take those steps of, of faith, especially in the ways James probably had in mind. We probably wouldn't be thinking like he thought, because this is a little more difficult time there. When he wrote this letter, at the time, the church there was suffering some persecution, right? And he's saying, guys, you've got to live out your faith, even in the midst of this persecution. And yet there are some moments where we see our faith grow the most, even though it's maybe not the persecution in our lives. Perhaps it's just through suffering. Hard times come and we're suffering through it. Are we going to trust the Lord? You know, years ago I'd be going through some difficulties and there was an old chorus, maybe you guys remember it. Things are looking right for a miracle. Ain't no reason I should get hysterical. God, you've done it before. Lord, please open the door. Things are looking right for a miracle. I probably sang that song in that moment of suffering at least a dozen times or more. Okay? Because I didn't know what else to do. Okay. You know, and you trust God when you don't know what to do. And that's that faith, that muscle that you begin to exercise. Maybe it's just pain. Okay. Older you get, you get pain. I don't know if I can get it through this today because this is hurting me, God. I don't know if I can go and do what I want to do for you because this is, you know, you exercise through that hardship, persecution. My wife's faith, she probably told a lot of you people how it grew through that cancer time in her life, in like six years now, you know, but, you know, that how her faith grew as she anticipated that, re what it meant to have cancer, and as you go through that difficult process of dealing with the cancer, and the uncertainty of the end game from those things, and the continued uncertainty of the end game from that, and her heart, you know, the continued uncertainty, you know, but your faith grows because of those times. We grow stronger as we trust God. Not just in sickness, but we trust God, men even with our careers. We trust God with our family, men and women. You know, and our faith begins to grow stronger in those moments. Now, maybe James was just trying to inspire his church, okay? Maybe that's what he was doing, to, to keep going, to keep fighting the good fight, as the Apostle Paul says. Or maybe it had just been difficult just been so difficult for such a long time, you know, and he's just trying to inspire them at that point. Maybe a reminder that faith without actions is dead for those people was just the kind of blunt truth they needed to hear, okay, in that moment, and maybe that's what we need to hear as well today. You see, we live in an easy culture, don't we? Comparatively, big time. We live in an easy culture. And uh, it's totally different from the one James was writing in. So there's a, this audience is listening and they're experiencing things that are far more difficult than us. And to even live out their faith was far more difficult than what it takes for us to live out our faith. But there are believers even today all around the world who are faith, facing very real life or death 
situations. Persecution because of their faith. And the experience their faith is, is it's markedly different than the faith that you and I have to experience in this culture that we live in. So I just kind of remind you, want to remind you today some application points. I want to encourage you to find ways this week to put your faith into action. Now that would really be, you go, come on, be fine. Maybe you've never thought about putting your faith into action, okay? Maybe you're so self-consumed that you just don't think outside of what you think is important for you. And so look for how, look outside yourself. You know, open your eyes to the needs around you. And God, what can I do this week that evidences to me that my faith is real in the works that I do for you? Look, look for that. You know, it could be pushing, stopping someone, pushing a shopping cart and saying, I'm going to give you a ride. Just sit here for a while, okay? Just looking, looking around you. What, what could you do? And don't get too comfortable, okay? I would say this week. Or worse, complacent in your faith. Just don't do it, you know? You know, as you spend time each, each day in the Word of God, oh, wouldn't that be a way to really build our faith? <laughs> you know, just to hear from God every day. But as, you, as you're doing that, you know, uh, don't get complacent in your faith. Do what it says, you know, do what the Word of God says. Allow yourself to get into situations that will stretch you, that will help you grow as a believer. Allow yourself to be in those situations. Don't be afraid of, of doing the hard things for the Lord. Okay? Don't be afraid of those things. And pray that God would give you the courage to step out in faith with those moments. And that the courage to step out in faith today seems to be, I'm willing to speak up for Jesus. You know, I think that's the courageous thing it takes for most people. And myself included. Okay? I, I need to speak up for Jesus. We take the courage to do that. And remember, the world is hungry, guys, for the good news of Jesus Christ. They need it. Okay? They're hungry for it. And we are God's chosen messengers to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And what a joy it is to know that your faith is real, right? Amen. What a joy it is to know your faith is real. And what a joy it is to know that your faith works, okay? Your faith works. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you proved it by sending Jesus. And God, help us to be followers of you who, who care that our life evidences that we are your followers. Help us to have a love that is evidenced in the actions that we take and how we show your love for others. Help us to do those things. Help us to put others first. Help us to care about the needs of others. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes.